Changing the narrative one episode at a time. Welcome everyone to the Narrative Podcast. I'm your host, Halsey Allen. Narrative Podcast is the home of original people reciprocity, original people positivity, and positive frames of reference about original people and original culture. So, welcome all my narrators. Welcome anybody that may just now be tuning in and is not acquainted with my, uh, you know, platform and my content. I'll bring you up to speed in just a second. So, um, yeah, today is Thursday. I'm here live on the Near the Podcast. Um, we made it. We're halfway to the uh, weekend. Yesterday was hunt day, so we made it over to hunt. Um, so let me just brief all my uh, new listeners on my uh, platform what my content is about and what I'm attempting to do in this digital space. So uh, first of all, let's start at the um, name, Narrative, Narrative Podcast. Um, Basically, I titled uh, my podcast The Narrative Podcast because it's my personal belief, or no, it's actual factual fact, that the media weaves a false narrative about original people and original culture. Um, They do it intentionally. Um, They do it to uh, basically promote and sell news, push agendas, and, um, you know, distribute propaganda to people outside of our culture about us. So the reason why they do it, like I said, is to, you know, sell news, but they also do it to um, help the higher echelon, uh, stay in power, uh, and keep their socioeconomic stronghold they have over all, you know, resources and tangibles, basically like just to keep the rich people rich by um, portraying um, us in a certain light. And it's just um, financial financially beneficial to them and as well as uh, socially beneficial to them. Um, So what I want to do is just basically create a platform where I'm, um, you know, uh, correcting that oversight and just allowing uh, my people to flourish, um, play up our strengths, um, and pu- put us in a positive light, share positive frames of reference about our people and our culture. Um, so that's basically what my platform is about. It's all about positivity, uh, positivity, empowerment, upliftment, and um, you know, just celebrating ourselves as a people and as a culture. Um, you know, we are a strong, proud people. We have a, a diverse, rich culture. And, um, you know, basically I destroy um, the negative stereotypes on our, my platform by sharing positive frames of reference about our people and our culture. As a matter of fact, my tagline is the narrative podcast, changing the narrative one episode at a time by destroying negative stereotypes about original people and original culture. So, um, yeah, so now that you know about that, um, what I'm attempting to do is my with my digital space, the overall takeaway, I want my list, listening audience to get gain from my uh, content. If nothing else, it is, you know, how important it is to share uh, positive content about our people and our, our culture on our uh, platform. That's why I call my um, listening audience my narrators because we, you know, can tell, narrate our story better than anyone. We have the power to change the narrative as well. Um, With these digital devices, we walk around 
in our pockets and other places all day long, you know, sharing content, you know, sharing story updates and all that all day long. Because um, basically these days, you know, whatever you post online is your uh, carbon footprint online. Um, the content that you post on any platform is, you know, a correlation of your beliefs, value systems, and who you are as a person and, you know, how you was raised and, you know, people associate you with your content. So just imagine us as a people, uh, you know, people outside of our culture, from the outside looking in, they're only given negative frames of reference about our people and our culture. So just imagine if we are posting negativity online. We're feeding into the negative stereotypes. We're embracing it and feeding into it. So just imagine if we're always just, you know, posting gang culture, um, you know, violence culture, fight culture, um, thought culture, pimp culture, whore culture, um, you know, drug culture. Just imagine we're using our platform just to uh, just, you know, embrace and feed into the negative stereotypes that's uh, circulating around about our people. You know, they're going to associate that with, you know, all of us and believe we're all that way and, you know, assume the worst and treat us like the worst. Um, it's not the uh, definitive end-all, be-all answer, but, you know, it is the solution-based answer just to um, post content, positive content about your people and your uh, culture online, like share stories about leadership, um, entrepreneurship, unity, uh, family structure, that's the type of content you will find on my platform on there, the podcast. I don't, you know, do gossip and um, denigrate and drag my brothers and sisters through the mud. Um, I use my platform to, you know, uplift, edify, and um, impact and empower our people. So that's my, um, you know, ultimate takeaway that I want you to get from my content. And then I'll give you more about my content a little later on before I dive into the uh, content today. Today is a live broadcast day. And so typically when I go live, what I do is um, share articles about our people and our culture um, to, you know, again, to provide the positive frames of reference about our people and our culture. And then, um, and when I'm saying our culture, our people, I'm an original man and like AKA black. And you know, that's my culture, original people culture and uh, I'm an original uh, person. So now that I let you know about my uh, platform, what it is, what, I'm, what it's about, what I'm trying to accomplish in, in this digital space, I'm gonna go back to the original part because I noticed, you know, like, why does he keep saying original? Well, um, on my platform, I refer to our people as original people as often as possible as opposed to being black because A, I believe in the power of words. And then B, you know, I think the word original um, is better suited to define this, you know, as a people. And what do I mean by that? Well, I'm getting to it right now. Um, at the beginning of time and early civilization, like our people, we was here 5,000 uh, years before pretty much every single person on the planet, every, um, you know, ethnicity, race, creed, culture, whatever, we was first here on the planet on all corners of the globe. And so, during that time, you know, we uh, created, you know, language and written and spoken language. 
So, and the way we use the word black to describe ourselves and just, um, you know, things about our culture, it was all positive. It was all powerful. It was all um, impactful and all encompassing. But as time went on, other people started, you know, progressing and moving through life. Um, people who we educated and nurtured and taught to survive um, saw fit to just kind of tweak the narrative and flip it and change it. And um, throughout the course of time, they colonized it and made it mean something foul and dirty and um, negative. So like, for example, if you go into the English dictionary and you look up the word black, you'll see all these um, negative things about the word black, um, how it's used, you know, but first, like the first thing you will notice um, when you're looking up the word black, it's the only color in the dictionary that denotes origin. Like it'll start off, you know, saying, you know, Aboriginal people or original people descending from Africa, something along those lines, letting you know, you know, anybody who has an African lineage is black. And then um, after that, you will see these little uh, verbs, nouns, pronouns, adjectives, all these uh, descriptive words instructing you how to use the word black, you know, like black, gloomy, desolate, depressed, um, and basically they're equating black with, you know, all, all things negative. The way they have it in a dictionary, black symbolizes death, black symbolizes sickness, black symbolizes the uh, end of all things. And we're anything but sick, dying, um, and over with, you know. We're anything but that. Um, now you look in that same dictionary and look at the word original ori there's no negative connotation surrounding the word original original basically means the first and in uh, most cases the best you know you want the original formula um, if you have some legalities you want to dispute something you want the original receipt to prove the case um, you know, everything pretty much pales in comparison to original. You know, like when movies come out, like the original version usually is the best version. Well, like when they do remakes of old movies, it's like, it's all right, but you, you know, the original version was better. So having said that, said all that to say, we was here like 5,000 years before everybody else on the planet. We were and are the original man and the original woman of this planet. Um, and we originated pretty much all things. We originated uh, written language, spoken language. We originated, we were the original teachers, scholars, um, philosophers, uh, you know, scientists, alchemists, um, original um, uh, doctors uh, or original physicians, um, just original carpenters, original builders, original uh, architects. Like we originated pretty much every modern day convenience we now have in the world. It started with us. And so that's why it, I just, you know, often refer to ourselves my, my people as original as opposed to black because it just kind of from my perspective it triggers something negative because it's been ingrained into us that it means something bad something negative you know a black cat 
is bad luck, you know. Uh, you know, black, like a, a mean person, like a mean spirited person is like, you know, they have a black personality. Um, in movies, bad guys always wore black in the hero, like in Westerns, the, the black, the bad guy wore black and the hero wore, wore white. So, you know, it's just that, that psychosomatic, that, 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 you know, psychological warfare at play that makes, that triggers something negative within us when we hear that word black. But, you know, black is beautiful. Black is, you know, powerful and impactful. But like I said, the colonizers got a hold of it and flipped the narrative and made it mean something foul and dirty. And our subconsciousness has locked on to it. And we acted out negatively, when you, especially here in America, when you look at our people as a whole and abroad as well, our living conditions as a people. So, you know, on my platform, I try to refer to us as um, original as often as possible in reference to our people and our culture. So it's not that I'm ashamed of being black. Uh, I just feel like original is just better, you know, sounds better and is just a more accurate term for us as opposed to black. So, but if you like saying black, if you want to refer to yourself as black, you know, no judgment. Do what you want to do. But on my platform, I refer to our people and our culture as original. That's it, and that's all. And now I'm going to dive into this content. So today on the Narrative Podcast, this is a live edition. And what I do on um, live when I'm broadcasting live is share articles that came across my uh, radar to provide the positive frame of reference about our people and our culture. Then after I'm done covering... Um, the articles, sharing the articles, I dive into, you know, commentary, uh, stories, just um, circumventing around the world or the internet, you know, just breaking news, delivering commentary on that. And then after I'm done with that, I give you a walkthrough for my um, new people listening. Um, you know, what you will look forward to from the narrative podcast on a full broadcast day. And my full broadcast day is, you know, on weekends. Today is a weekday. I go live randomly throughout the week. Um, I never know what days, but for sure during the weekday, I do a live every single weekday. I try to, unless I have something going on. Um, just a few weeks ago, I had, you know, set up some deadlines for myself, um, working on some new projects, and I just took a weekend off to um, get things in motion. So I'm going uh, to share, you know, what I'm working on, you know, after I'm done with the content and um, plug it in everything else that I'm going on before I leave you guys tonight. But uh, here we go. Narrow the podcast live edition. We're diving into the content. So... I'm about to share some articles with you. So, for my first article, the headline reads, Meet the founder of the first black woman-owned self-sustainable container home manufacturing facility. Um, Basically what that is, y'all, this is like uh, houses, like, you know, like storage bins, This is like, you know, houses constructed from the same material as storage bins. And what they're for is like people that want to live off the grid or, you know, people seeking refuge from um, a natural disaster as opposed to, you know, going to a, um, uh, a homeless shelter or, you know, a disaster shelter. You can like just have your own actual house 
and they're darn near indestructible. You can heat them, you know, they hold heat, hold air, um, sturdy, affordable to live in. Um, so they're just like really ingeniously designed. And like I said, it's about the same material you would find in like a, a storage container. It's about that material. So it can withstand the elements, though. It's like a little denser um, material than that. But, uh, you know, it's definitely worth checking out if you are considering living off the grid or, uh, you know, have just recently or know of someone who has lost everything due to a natural disaster or a fire. So to check that out, you go to uh, startengine.com backslash or forward slash bond containers and, you know, check that out. Oh, I forgot to tell you the uh, sister's name. Her name is uh, Tamika Sherry Bond. And that hints the title Bond Containers. So, uh, so yeah, give a warm narrative podcast. Round of applause for Tamika Bond and the Bond Containers. So my next story, the headline reads, Meet the five-year-old boy who served 13 people from a house fire in Chicago. And the young brother's name is Jalen Esponsas. Um, So basically what happened was a fire ensued and he knew what to do. Oh, wow, that was a bar. The fire ensued, he knew what to do. Um, so he knew the drill. He called 911, kept his composure, um, told them the exact address of where the fire was, um, how many people was in the building. He gave them the whole who walk and the whole who went, and they put out the fire, got everybody to safety. And um, so, you know, that's very good to teach your children what to do in an emergency. His parents obviously taught him, you know, what to do in an emergency like that and to only call, you know, the fire department when there is an actual emergency because sometimes children, they do the prank calling and, or you know, cry wolf and just to get attention. But, you know, not this young man. He actually you know, did the right thing and got the, uh, you know, respected authorities out there and they responded in rapid um, with a sense of urgency, which is, you know, unusual for Chicago. You know, like the song said, like the old song said, get up, get, get, get now. Hey, 911, where you take down? 911, this is choking your town. You know, like flags for me and why, but I'm just saying, like, usually, you know, Chicago, like most neighborhoods are like high crime areas. And yeah, but that's, that's remarkable that he knew to keep his composure speak, you know, clearly enough for them to understand, and they responded and, you know, got everybody to safety, so give a warm narrative podcast round of applause for young brother Jalen. All right. So tonight is just a light bite on the articles. Like I get like hundreds and hundreds of them that like, uh, you know, cross my radar 
and I usually share it within like four to five of them, usually on live. But you know, I just I did three tonight because I I, w- I was just thinking about you know the commentary tonight this evening, and it's just like I really want to focus on that. I really feel like I want to. Um, also, for my listening audience, I try to make my um, podcast as briefly as brief as possible. But we got some serious stuff to talk about with the content, and you know, for the commentary, and I want to really get into it. So I just kind of, you know, ease back on the articles this evening because got some serious stuff to talk about. All right. So last article reads, headline reads, 26-year-old entrepreneur went from being homeless to owning his own Subway franchise. And the young brother's name is Chris Williams II. Um, So he had a real... uh, convoluted backstory so he's from Chicago he's li- currently living in Atlanta by way of Chicago he's originally from Chicago Illinois like dang that's weird like two articles from people from Chicago like I will say that like people from Chicago they're a different breed like that's a, that's a rough little city man like you know you have no choice but to be have that survival mentality But um, anyway, more to my point. Um, he basically started his own um, Subway franchise. He was homeless, pursuing his dreams. Uh, he was doing sales for a little bit. And then, uh, or like actually, excuse me, he ended up going to uh, getting him some education you know, he was studying in college, uh, studying ma- studying marketing and um, sales and all that. Um, he got a sales uh, job through a, a Fortune 5 com- 500 company that he was working on at the time. Um, then also went through like some internal training programs to get him some leadership skills. Um, so he had like his um, path to becoming a, a franchise owner was very complicated. Like he went through a whole lot of transitions. Like I would be like 20 minutes like running down his resume. But um, ultimately he ended up, you know, getting his own Subway franchise. So congratulations to that brother. Um, Chris Williams the second, you know, nothing really trumps owning your own, your own, like, like, I, I feel a little conflicted when I share them stories about franchise owners, like, it's like the best ownership is when it's yours from the top to the bottom, because when you, you know, own something through a corporation, you have to keep it running through the corporation's, um, you know, their stencil, their uh, design, their my, uh, business module. So it's yours, but then not yours. You know what I'm saying? But um, it's still impressive. Nevertheless, it's a good positive uh, frame of reference about entrepreneurship. That's the reason why I shared it. But um, yeah, that was just you. Was, I was just thinking out loud with that one. But uh, congratulations to. Chris Williams the second and give him a warm narrative podcast round of applause. Okay, I know I said I was going to um, dive into the uh, commentary, but I just wanted to share something like really amazing that I came across. It was like, wow, I did not know that. Like, it came across my radar. It just like super fascinating. So apparently, like I know everybody's seen the uh, movie uh, Panther, and I and uh, most recently. Uh, 
I shared um, some um, information about where they got the uh, inspiration for uh, the movie Panther. And they got it from, you know, of course, Africa. Um, there was this uh, tribe called um, Sears in Africa, like near the you know, like Mount Kilimanjaro area. And, you know, they actually had an, an herb, like, you know, in the movie that gave the Black Panther his power, an herb. You know, that gives them like supernatural ability, clairvoyance, and all that. This tribe. Um, I already shared that information, but um, so there was like an actual, you know, Black Panther ritual before it was a comic book adapted into the comic book series and the movies. But, like, it was an actual factual fact. Like, these people been around thousands of years using this herb to gain, you know, supernatural powers. But um, apparently, we also have, you know, a form of vibranium here on Earth. It's true, it's like it got here in the form of an asteroid. And like the second largest deposit of it, this asteroid that came to Earth, landed here with this magnificent, you know, substance, this near, this um, nearly impervious, impervious to everything, can withstand high levels of heat, and is like almost like anti-corrosive, like it won't rust, and they use it on um, spaceships and stuff, like to coat the um, spaceships so they don't burn up upon re-entry. And the stuff's called iridium. And they got like huge deposits of it in Haiti. And it's been here thousands of years. I, like I'm now years old, I never heard of that. And check this out, and like an ounce of it is almost a quarter of a million dollars. But Hades, you know, financially broke. And they got uranium. They got just uranium just everywhere. But our government goes over there and then takes it. Uh, European nations go over there and take it. China, Asian countries go over there and just take take it. You know, but um, that's just it was just fascinating because it just I'm sh like sharing it because you know there's more and more like evidence that there was like you know some extra terrestrial type stuff going on on this planet. And then another, you know, piece of that puzzle, to piggyback off the Iridium thing, was, you know, this tribe in Africa called the Dogon tribe. Now the Dogon, they knew about stars and constellations and planets and, you know, constellations and all that before telescopes were ever invented. They say we are the stars. Our people, like, we come from the stars. That's, you know, the Dogon people say that. Like, they knew all, you know, the Milky Way and all that and before telescopes was ever even invented. And then, like, okay, check this out. One more last thing connecting the dots before I dive into the um, content. And then we all know um, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, you know, read, wrote a book a while ago about the wheel. And now we're having 
all these sightings of these, you know, aircraft just right above, you know, the stratosphere. And like all these military uh, constellate, all these military forces trying to like move toward them, you know, and like it's just, it's trippy to me. It's just like, you know, the sweaters unraveling, like all the dots are starting to connect. Iridium, okay, the Dogon tribe, and then like the wheel. So there's like all these signs pointing to something that's, you know, beyond everybody's comprehension level, like you know, interplanetary type stuff. But um, that was just, it was just some mind blowing content. I want to share right quick. That was just, it was just amazing when I heard about that Iridium. Okay, so now that I got that out the way, I'm going to dive into this evening's content, commentary. Um, so some things circulating the news, really just, uh, just two things. Now, the first thing I'm addressing, the only reason I'm addressing that is just because I feel we don't need to be addressed, but everybody is like, it's going viral right now. So like everybody's talking about it. Um, I feel it's not really noteworthy for my platform, but the only, like, again, the only reason why I'm talking about it is just to just let y'all know we shouldn't be talking about it. We got, we literally got bigger fish to fry than this particular um, thing going on, like, Um, so basically, uh, excuse me, just have it. Um, I'm sorry, I just got lost my train of thought. It's just like, it's really not all that important to address, but um, unless you've been living up under a rock, you know, uh, the rainbow-haired kid, he got the beats put on him, like Takashi 6 9 he got beat the, uh, up, supposedly. And I feel it's like everybody's talking about it, and this this guy, this young man, he's like the king of controversy, the king of cat. So how do we know that, you know, this isn't a publicity stunt because he, you know, he snitched on somebody and then turned around and did an album about snitching. And now we're living in the era of sensationalism. Where people, you know, would tell you to do something dangerous and then put it online and, you know, reap the benefits of the clicks and the views and, you know, whatever. And so as we know, we got all the, these entities that are financially linked to this guy. Like people got money invested into his brand. So... I'm just having a hard time believing it was just like karma coming to him because he told on people like they beat him up because he told like if anything for all the stuff he did he got more than a beat down coming so to me from my perspective I think it's a, a publicity stunt because we haven't seen any actual video footage of him getting stomped out. He's just like, they're releasing a, uh, 
he's saying he's in the hospital and his um, face was, you know, like swollen or whatever. And to me, he don't really look all, you know, puffed up and lumped up and all that. I'm going to punch it up. I haven't really been following the story because, like I said, I don't really believe that uh, it's worth talking about. Like, I just, I don't believe it. Because it's just like he's, not, he's never, even before the allegations of him being in the form, even before that, He's never did anything beneficial for the culture. You know, he's never like culturally did nothing significant to propel the culture forward or contribute to it other than just, you know, selling, selling the music. I give him that like for the uh, groundbreaking streams. You can't take that away from him because, you know, before everything happened, he, he was like winning every type of award you can win for like the most downloads and you know people buying his music so we're not going to do that we're not going to discredit them in in that respect but any everything else like the, his actual content the stuff that he was saying in his rhymes like it didn't benefit the culture at all it wasn't uplifting it wasn't like you can get I mean it was just entertaining so I don't, I don't really know what it contributed to the culture anyway but um I'm I'm, I'm trying to uh, punch up this photo right now to see if it's official or if it's just look like you know Yeah, it's just like, I just pulled the TMZ up. It says he's like severely beaten up. Okay, well they do got it. Okay, now they're saying the video has surfaced. Punching up the video. So he said he was working out at the South Florida gym. Rest to an ambulance. Oh, yeah, he stopped him. But again, sensationalism. Like, wrestlers really be getting punched in the face. Um, wrestlers really, like, get be getting socked in the mouth. Getting their uh, ribs cracked and all that. Going through tables, you know beaten with fold up chairs like the fold up chairs be really real solid but they be taking the hits and so that footage to me looks like you know he's taking the hit like to me from my perspective it looks really contrived um the article says brutally beaten but he got up and he was talking mess so that didn't look like a brutal beating to me. And not that I'm crossing my fingers hoping the young man gets brutally beaten. But um, to me, just like it seems just like another marketing ploy, another way to garner attention. Like somebody put him up to it and said, oh, what's the next thing? Because we already did the snitch thing. We milked that cow. So now... Oh, he finally gets what he deserves. We'll do that. We finally gets what he deserves. He got a he got a uh, whipping, and we caught it off him. I I just don't buy it. I don't buy it.
And so nothing's like nothing's coming up what happened to the dude to beat him because he's already a snitch, so why you ain't call the police on him? So I, I don't know. I'm not sold on it. Not that I was really keeping up, but um, not sold on it. Nah, I don't buy it for one second. All right, <clears throat> but now to the main feature, the um, thing that really, you know, I feel noteworthy for this podcast to talk about is some actually noteworthy for the narrative podcast um, content that, uh, worth talking about. Um, and again, I don't um, condone, you know, gossip. I don't condone gossip. I don't promote gossip. I don't feed into gossip. But I do address current um, news as it pertains to us. Uh, And the way I do it is I unpack it from our perspective because the media have have us looking and sounding crazy. So, but... um, you know, with fur- no further ado, I'm gonna just I'm gonna dive in it because this really kind of touched the heartstring and it makes me just look at it from the bigger picture. So I'm looking at this thing. Next thing I'm about to talk to talk about from the bigger picture, like what's this, what's the bigger picture to this? What's it really saying? Um, first of all. Um, If you didn't know, like if you unless you've been living under a rock, uh, Sierra's Oscar dress, like it was super ultra sheer, and essentially, she was basically naked on the red carpet. For the Oscars or whatever award show that was, let me see, you can punch it up so I can kind of sound credible, like I know what I'm talking about, because I don't really keep up with those. What was it, the Oscars? Uh, yeah. So it was her Oscars dress. She was at the Oscars. Okay. All right. I'm taking a deep dive into this because this is super duper important. Um, when I heard about the, uh, you know, dress, I had to, of course, see it for myself, even though I did not watch the Oscars. Um, went and seen the footage of the dress. And to no avail, um, she's naked, nakedness. Ultra sheer, you can see her breasts. She got a thong on. Like, what the hell? (laughs) So this is not me judging her for wearing the dress. This is just an assessment on what they do to our sisters, the hypersexualization of our sisters. So before I do a deep dive into it, I just want to say, I do, I'm a firm believer, you know, in a woman's body, she can like do what she wants to with it. She can give her, you know, body to whomever she wants to give it to. Um, she can do whatever she wants to with her body. It's her body. She can do whatever she wants to with it. And it's nobody's business. But here is the however part. However, when you put it in that space, it becomes everybody's business. 
because celebrities, whether you want to concede to it or not, uh, when you become a celebrity, when you become well known, you have a polarizing effect and you do, you are a representation of us as a people. So when you're on your platform, you know, as they say, living your best life, you know, the things that come out of your mouth and how you carry and conduct yourself while in the eye of the public is a direct representation of us as a people, whether you want it to be or not. That's what you signed up for when you became a, a recording artist, when you became an actress, uh, you know, when you became a politician, when you became whatever. You know, you signed up for the scrutiny. You signed up to represent us as well. Now, a couple things, well, the very first thing, the most important thing, um, it was absolute, uh, you know, these European fashion designers, they think they slick. Um, it's, it's flesh peddling. When they design these dresses, they design them to peddle flesh because they never want European white women wearing dresses like that. They go snatch a sister to model the dress. And they put that, they instill that in them when they're wearing stuff like that, like it's art. You know, they talk to them, it's art. It's, it's you know, it's way nouveau. It's, it's uh, whatever, whatever like the artsy farsy lingo is. Try to have you, you know, convinced on the, uh, the lines, the contours, the, um, the shape and the way the light will hit it and, you know, the shadowing and all that. And what really it is, is just, you know, it's smut. And they do it to our sisters. And not just like fashion wise, like in films too, you know, when they're making these movies that have her a scene just for no reason, full frontal nudity, or rolling out of bed with some guy, you know, and they say it's just art, it's to sell the movie, or, you know, the jumping, the climax, or whatever. But in reality, is it just, it's like it's peddling flesh. Um, this story kind of reminds me of one of the first things that came to mind about this dress and like sisters like her, sisters like Beyonce, sisters like, um, you know, Doja Cat, um, Little Kim, um, you know, anybody who has gone on to like, you know, Cardi B, um, who else? Like, well, she got a reason. She was a stripper at one time, but I digress. But, like, it just reminded me of the story of Sarah Bartman. And if you don't know who Sarah Bartman is, like, Google it. But there's tons of books up about her, about, you know, when she was alive. Um, and basically, she was, you know, like straight out of the bush, like right from the Middle Passage, straight out of slavery, um, went over to Europe, and they basically, they kept her in a cage, um, put her on display, like have her, had her like an actual freak show, because to white people, she was an anomaly, they were intrigued and fascinated by her bodily dimension, or her bodily dimensions. Um, she had it all, man. She was thicker than a snicker. Um, she had, you know, thick lips, thick thighs, a really big butt, dairy air, ass, breasts, like good, probably like a double D. And you know, 
she was kept in a cage and put on display for her white men to ogle at and even at some point they start pimping her out. There was like having dudes basically rape her on an avid day, like repeatedly. So like she already had a big butt. It got even bigger towards the end of her life because she developed, you know, cancerous tumors on it. Then not only that, STDs and STIs from being raped by men. But said all that to say they had her on display. And that's what they're doing to like all our sisters, you know, in these industries, in the recording industry. They got to do the album cover with the uh, legs gapped open and, you know, with their breasts out. Um, films, like, you know. Their debut, their biggest thing that they'll win award for is they do a full frontal nude shot. Or, you know, a scene in the movie where it's just basically like softcore porn. Like I think, matter of fact, Holly Berry's first award she won was for Monsters Ball, that scene where her and uh, Billy Bob Thornton, like, they was like, you can see everything, you know what I'm saying? Like, that scene. And they only do that to sisters. Um, the Dress J-Lo wore. Now, these European fashion designers, supposedly, most of these guys are homosexual males, not interested in women at all, but yet they design dresses leaving nothing to the imagination and you never see Caucasian women wearing them. Only sisters. And they put in certain minds, oh, it's just art. And no, don't wear a bra up underneath it because if you wear a bra, you will, uh, you know, you'll destroy the vision. It won't look right with a bra. It won't look right with panties. And so now we got this stigma you know, the hypersexualization of our women in front of us, you know, and that's the reason why the original woman is the most disrespected woman on the planet, because of that stuff, stuff like that. Um, you know, some, some, some places where it's all right to do it, so like where it makes sense, where your nudity makes sense, like if you are an exotic dancer and you're posting content online, like you're posting like where you're going to be stripping at or you know, you got your own stripper page, that makes sense, you're advertising your brand, you're a stripper. Makes sense, right? Um, if you are an adult film starling and you got a page, you're advertising your uh, adult movies that you're in, that makes sense. That makes sense. It makes perfect sense. You know what you're signing up for. You know what you're getting when you follow this person. She's an adult film starling. That makes sense. Um, like, or if you're a, a Instagram model, a twerker, um, there is like all kind of parameters where the nudity is acceptable. It's okay for that because like you got to, you know, sign permissions and are you 18 and all that. That makes sense in that parameter. What doesn't make sense is when an R&B singer comes out, a female rapper comes out, a brand new uh, uh actress in Hollywood comes out and she's bearing it naked to the world for what? Why? Why does she got to get butt naked to get traction on a project? Why? 
Why can't she win an award unless she gets butt naked in a movie or on an uh, album cover? So it's like a real, it's it's a real thick, sick plot to do this with the um, you know, hypersexualization of our women. Like, and again, you know, we got cultures where it's acceptable nudity. Like in Central America, they don't be tripping. Um, Brazil, uh, bellies. Um, you know, mostly like Central America, um, in Europe, but we ain't in Europe, we ain't in Central America, we here in the States, and why you gotta get butt naked to have somebody take you serious as an artist? Why are you, like, producing pornography and calling it art, like telling these actresses, telling these recording artists, you know, oh, it's just art. It's art. And it's not art, it's porn. So, while, you know, Miss Sierra, she had, uh, like, absolute right to make a choice. Um, she's a grown woman, but she's also a mother and also a married woman. And the guy she's married to is supposed to be, like, a devout Christian. So, like, how? How was that even acceptable? Like, how are you on a red carpet? How did you leave the house like that? Who said that was okay? Like, how did the conversation go? That's just like, again, the hyper criminalization, uh, sexualization, and exploitation of our women. It goes all the way back to Sarah Bartman. That's what I think of when I see sometimes when I'm watching, you know, I've never actually been to an actual concert, but, you know, Beyonce's gyrations, sometimes, some of the outfits she wears, um, you know, Little Kim throughout her career, she had, uh, she came, her first big show where she had the pasty on, had, you know, I think it was the left breast or the right breast exposed and she had a pasty on. It's like, you know, tell sisters all the time, this is more. Like, again, certain places where it's all right. Like, if you're doing the dating thing online, as the song goes, it goes down in the DM. If you want to DM a man or a woman, because you got to be, you know, equal opportunity in that. I don't know who's, I don't know. But whoever you decide to send your naked to in the DM, that's y'all's business. It ain't nobody's business. In the DM, as long as it's in the DM, you text them something that you want them to see for their eyes only, and nobody else is seeing it but the person you send it to, that's acceptable. Like, what's not acceptable is we just when you pull out your device and you see, you know, a sister's legs gapped open, and you can see all the contours of her vagina or her bare exposed breasts. Like, that's not okay. Like, I get some instances where it would be okay if you're like a cancer survivor, I'd be cancer, you go topless. Okay. Acceptable. Um, you was like, you were, was like darn near obese, 600 pound, you know, life, and then you dieted and you exercised and got all that weight off you the correct way, and you wear a two-piece bathing suit. It's not new, it's just like a two-piece bathing suit. All right, cool. You know, a mini skirt, high. A midi skirt, I. But like, 
Daisy Dukes with your cheeks hanging out. It's not all right. A mini skirt with no panties or, you know, with the, uh, with the see-through, with the, uh, you know, the ones with the uh, panel not there. Not all right. And, like, you can't say my body, my choice on that. Not when you have a polarizing platform. You can't say my body and my choice on that. Not when young ladies are looking at you. You can't say my body, my choice when you got, you know, young ladies watching the event at home and they're trying to, you know, emulate you. And then, you know, if you want to flip it around on men, oh, well, what about that men when they, they uh, walking around with their pants sagging off their butt? Okay, yeah, you got us on that one. We, need, we do need to stop that. But, like, you know, we can't keep on falling into the trap. We can't keep on taking the easy bag and compromising our morals and our integrity to, you know, get the bag. You know, because if you're taking the money to be naked, then what does that make you? Sex sells. So if you're letting people pay you to see your naked body, your flesh being peddled, on a public platform, what's that make you? Huh? Yeah, I said it's a, said it kind of mean and kind of funky, but hey, that's it's a wake up call. Something got to shake. But um, yeah, that's all I wanted to say. Like that dress is just modern day Sarah Bartman all over again when they're designing them outfits for our, our sisters. Cause like, can't no man, I don't care like, you know, what religious background he's from, what spirituality you're practicing. You cannot compose yourself when a woman's in your presence like that. You can't. You can't keep it together I don't care how like disciplined you say you are. No way, no way can you keep it together when you're looking at that. I mean, like if you you are disciplined, you practice spiritual discipline. At the very least, you can avert your gaze. But still, if it's sitting up in front of you and you're a man, you're a heterosexual male, you're going to look. But that's all I want to say on that. And um, she got a whole lot of backlash. Um, like I said, I don't try to use my platform to denigrate or tear down people. I was just, you know, I was using that as an example to, you know, show how they are hypersexualizing our women and, you know, putting them on display for the world to see basically pimping them out in their uh, movies and um, in the record industry and in the modeling industry as well because, you know, they have models, sisters that are models walking down the uh, runway basically butt naked and, you know, the European counterparts, they're like covered up and they butt naked walking down the runway. All right, well, that was it for my commentary this evening. 
Um, I try to keep these real brief and to the point. So I'm going to walk you guys through my um, normal broadcast day for the narrative podcast and then uh, leave you to enjoy your evening. Um, so first, first of all, I broke it down into sections and each, I gave each section the speaking points. Uh, when I first started my podcast, I noticed something. I noticed they all were, you know, super duper long and no one was listening. So I shortened it and I broke it up into sections and gave each section a speaking point. And when I did that, you know, my audience doubled. So first and foremost, um, I start with my uh, promotional section. And my promotional section is for uh, original people, uh, businesses that own and operate their own businesses. Um, they can reach out to me if they need or would like free promotion. And the reason why I'm doing that is to give them the opportunity to, you know, plug their businesses and also to do my part to help circulate the original people dollar and within the original people community. So while we are due reparations, you know, we have to uh, support and endorse one another until we get it. So, you know. We also have to keep the conversation of reparations going, but, you know, if there's no conversations in your neck of the woods, then create one. Like, write your senator, your congressman, or whoever, senator, governor, congressman, you know, get them petitions going. If you can't do it like that, you know, you can do it digitally. Create you a little Facebook group. Um, YouTube, TikTok, utilize your platforms, but you got to definitely keep the conversation going. So shout out to everybody that's keeping the um, conversation going because, you know, first of all, it's like not a handout. It's what's owed. So it's money owed. It's not a handout. And then two, this is going to go back into the economy anyway. So what's the big hold up? And three, every single ethnicity that ever came to the shores of America. If America has wronged them in any way, America has financially compensated them. We are the only group that America directly violated our civil and human rights and never compensated us one dime for. Now there are people that filed individual reparations and got it, but us as a people, we have not. There's people that got reparations for themselves, just individually, but like as a whole, as a people, that's not happened. Everybody else, you know, has gotten compensated from America except us. But um, anyway, I veered off putting a little bit. I was really focused on the um, promotional thing. Um, you know, if you need or like free promotion, hit me up. You know, uh, see uh, my last four broadcasts. I believe that was episode 194 or 193. It was 193 or 194 with the uh, four promotion, one of them. But uh, yeah, check it out. All the uh, details is up in there. Um. So on to my second section, which is the uh, contest section. And the contest section is basically just an incentive section for my listeners that um, faithfully listen to me, as well as to um, try to attract some new listeners, give you a, a opportunity to win a prize just for listening to me 
participating in the content. Give a boat. I'm going to give you the opportunity to get a bulk supply of your favorite snack by participating in my contest topic. My contest topic is share your most recent shopping while black experience. And I give you all the information on how to, you know, enter the contest in a previously recorded episode. So go hit that up and um, go and get yourself a, a free bulk supply of your favorite snack. Now, my next section is basically the uh, heartbeat of the uh, podcast. That's my highlight section. In my highlight section, what I'm essentially doing is I'm highlighting um, you know, original people own businesses. And the reason why I'm doing that is to provide the positive frame of reference by entrepreneurialism because we don't see or hear positive frames of reference about people that got their own, how they acquired their own, and, you know, giving back to the community and all that, and, uh, you know, hiring their own and providing for the community. So in that section, that's exactly what I'm doing, is I'm highlighting businesses, um, people that basically came up from the mud, they didn't have previous, you know, education, uh, adequate startup money or prior knowledge of whatever business that they started, but uh, somehow they just did it. So I'm putting out that positive frame of reference that it is possible. Um, Another qualifying factor for it, um, this thing's acting kind of janky, so if you hear some feedback or me, you know, jostling around a little bit. Um, Just know that uh, I'm still here. I'm just adjusting my levels and everything. And uh, yeah. So yeah, um, I forgot what I was saying, like, okay, um, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyway, my next section was, sorry about all that feedback, my bad, but my next section, or that section, it just really is reflective of, um, you know, giving you the positive frame of reference about entrepreneurialism, doing for self uh, and doing for your community, all the uh, frames of references that I uh, give in that section is just people that came from the mud, didn't have any prior education, and, um, you know, did for self. And then lastly, so another qualifying factor is they either have their own nonprofit or organization or paid into a nonprofit organization. They hire their own. Um, many of the businesses I highlight in the highlight section are uh, family owned and operated. So, you know, that's a, a frame of reference about generational wealth. So, you know, that's good. Um, then next is my spotlight section. In the spotlight section, what I'm doing is I'm spotlighting a prominent figure within our community, usually somebody in the entertainment industry, um, you know, ranging from actors, actresses, um, uh, writers, producers, comedians, um, recording artists, um, You know, basically anybody with a a public platform that's in the eye of the public and, you know, represents our people well. Uh, They do some type of philanthropy. 
They do some type of self, uh, social uh, activism, political activism, uh, you know, just really turn the tide for us or just the way they carry and conduct themselves in the eye of the public, representing us as, a, um, you know, making us look good through them. But, um, yeah. I even uh, spotlight religious figures as well. But um, anybody basically, you know, speaking on the cause unapologetically on public platforms or um, donating, um, doing, donating resources to try to help, you know, change things, you know, those, those are the type of people I spotlight in the spotlight session. And to my own credit, I got to say, I created the way for spotlighting because before I created spotlighting, nobody, n n nobody was spotlighting anybody before I added a spotlight section to my podcast, the narrative podcast. And now every time you pull out your device, go online, you know, everybody's spotlighting now. Today, we will be spotlighting so-and-so and such and such. On today's episode of, we'll be spotlighting, da -da -da -da. nobody was spotlighting nobody before I had a spotlight this section to my podcast. And the reason I added the spotlight section to my podcast was to create the healthy habit of us talking positively about one another, uplifting each other instead of dragging each other through the mud and talking bad about each other and casting dispersions on one another online because we are the only people that do that but you know that's the reason why I created a spotlight section to basically give people the roads to why they're here and to create the healthy habit of saying something nice about your brother or your sister instead of something mean and nasty and denigrating so yeah I did that <laughs> I'm impacting, you know, this little internet, whether or not people endorse me or not, openly endorse me, you know, the proof's in the pudding because too many people are spotlighting. So, yeah, I got to take a bow on that one. You are now listening to the Narrative Project with Halsey Allen. The Narrative Project is changing the narrative one episode at a time. in a real way. All right, so after the spotlight section, we go on over to the, um, health and wellness section. And the health and wellness section is basically like promoting total body wellness, um, you know, mentally, physically, and spiritually to keep our immune systems fortified, to keep us, you know, healthy, active, and fit. I'm giving tips to keep us healthy, active, and fit. And the reason why I'm doing that, because we're bombarded with so much negativity, you know, it wreaks havoc on our bodies, and, you know, all these little nasty airborne bugaboos, the last thing we want to do is be, you know, sick or suffering or depressed or anything like that in these times we're living in. So I'm giving tips to, you know, stay ahead of the curve. So on, you know, the physical side of it, you might hear tips about, you know, the health benefits of a fruit, um, vegetable, plant, herb, extract, or elixir to keep you, you know, healthy physically. And um, other than that, you know, I do uh, physical exercises you can do for the, on the physical side, and then as well as mentally keeping your mind in check, to keep your mind focused, stuff you can do, um, spiritual stuff you can do to keep your spirit up. I'll give you all those tips and tricks about that. And then... Um, After the uh, health and wellness section, my next section is the uh, 
speaking point of the day. In the speaking point of the day, I'm addressing uh, current news. So what's ever trending in the media, breaking news, whatever is currently going on, I give you the uh, tips about, you know, my commentary on that. And what in that section, what I'm doing, attempting to do is to control the narrative because the media have us looking and sounding crazy. And so, like, I'm just unpacking it from our perspective. And, um, you know, telling our story the correct way. And after my speaking point is, you know, I'm ending the uh, podcast with, you know, my final thought or final word. It's usually, I don't know, I go, if I flip back and forth, the final thought or the final word of the day. Um, and it's basically uh, saying, um, you know, a gem, a pearl of wisdom, something profound, something provocative, something that will make you think about it, whatever I'm talking about, and just leaving you with something that will resonate with you. And so there you have it, the Narrative Podcast in its entirety. So tune in this weekend and listen to me, Harvey Allen on the Narrative Podcast. Um... So if you have not had a chance, go online and purchase my book, The Black Card. The Black Card is available in the bookstore of the Poetizer Life, or the, poet, or the bookstore over on Poetizer at poetizer.com. So go purchase you the uh, Black Card. Um, also support my po personal poetry blog. Uh, Hawes' Poetry Corner at www.mrhawes'blogs.com. That's an amalgamation of just insightful poetry that I just randomly type at the spur of the moment. It's very uh, creative. Go support that. And the way you support it is go to www.mrhawes'blog.com and share a poem from Hawes' Poetry Corner on any and all your favorite platforms, like on your Facebook, on your Twitter, on your YouTube, on, you know, your whatever. And, you know, support it. And, and as always, download this episode and our previously recorded episodes of the Narrative Podcast. And tune in regularly. So you don't miss um, me when I'm recording broadcasting live like I am today. And that'll do it for the live episode of the Narrative Podcast. That's it and that's all, y'all. I'm out of here like last year. Halsey Allen and the Narrative Podcast is signing off. Till next time, join me next time. Download this episode and all previously recorded episodes of the Narrative Podcast. Harvey Allen and the Narrative Podcast signing off, and it's like that. Thank <laughs> you.